I really think that, similar to what Vika said, it's so exciting to be part of the forum discussing some of the coming crises of the international world, whether it's climate crises, migration crises, financial crises, but done so with the energy and excitement that this kind of forum actually encourages, because I think so many of us have been to um, some of the summits that occur in formal international institutions, you know, whether that be not just a well, Paris summit, but, you know, we can think about, um, you know, in terms of these spaces that are supposed to provide voice for the world in the South, for, um, you know, continents of Africa, we can think of the EU African Union Summit, we can think of the US um, African Leader Summit that Biden hosted in 2022. And a lot of these forums, I think, are designed to be almost in it as anemic as possible, to um, uh, anaesthetize the, the antagonisms that are on the right of our international world and to empty out these kind of buzzwords that are often thrown around from you know, security to peace to development to sustainability, um, continue to, to repeat them, but empty them out of any actual political content. Um, and I think that this kind of opportunity for a conversation from across different expertise and researchers reminds us what internationalism could have been. Um, you know, I think there's going to be enough discussion over the next um, few hours about some of the myopias and mistakes of the kind of new international economic order moment. Um, so I won't you know, leave the point too much, but I think the one big kind of gap that, that I would really emphasize is the extent to which so many of those leaders who emerge often from movements, from anti-colonial movements, then really invested their faith in the institutions of international law. You know, he, Nkrumah describes the United Nations as the only hope for mankind. You know, you know, we get the same with, you know, quotes from Nerere for um, Mandi or points. And I think that, you know, what we want to do in, in, in people have already discussed about how the rules of the international order are kind of set up to limit the type of transformation that we might want to advocate. But I think we also want to consider the entire approach to internationalism. Mm -hmm. Think about how the institutionalization of internationalism, which actually occurs prior to the post war um, order. Just so, closing. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> Is it on? Summary? Yeah, feels that awesome. Yeah, I think that the the institutionalization of international law that you know really occurs in the kind of interwar period, you know, I'm thinking here the work of people like Jacob Martin, Ethan Bedlers, where he talks about um, it's actually in that kind of institutionalization, bureaucratization of universalism and moralism that you get in the League of Nations, you get in the Bank of International Settlements that encourages the, yeah, like I say, that anemic approach to international issues that we have to this day. Um, and we can think about elements like the mandate system, the way that transformed the antagonisms of colonial exploitation into, you know, that system of kind of, yeah, common law trusteeship that was implemented. Um, you know, we can think about how these, um, yeah, th th those gaps of, of faith around the United Nations and what institutional approach to, to law could allow for, um, I think, missed out on the way in which capital, race, <coughs> empire, all these, all these words that you don't hear of at those spaces, like Paris or Washington, um, continue to determine so much of great world politics. Um, but what I would like to conclude on is also by, I think, uh, uh, a, a gesture towards the hope of this contemporary moment. You know, I think this fantastic point made earlier by Richard about the way in which a lot of the um, systems of exploitation of southern labor have started to lead their way to the great north, the way in which capital is commodified, the security of social democracy allows for um, a certain opportunity for new spaces of dialogue, um, the way in which um, I would say so much of the systems of wealth and equality, the systems of 
the, of the precarity of labour um, have started to become concerns not just of people in the global south, but for also working people struggling under a cost of living crisis. You know, I'm speaking also from the United Kingdom, which is an outlier in the inflationary um, dynamics, you know, which is an outlier in terms of the crunch of the cost of living. Um, in the 1980s, the United Kingdom, particularly after Thatcher's um, election, was one of the big opponents of the international economic order. You know, she goes to Cancun, you know, before Reagan's really even established himself, and is the real, um, you know, champion of the of the of the opposition towards um, any kind of transformation. You know, goes back to Prime Minister, brags about destroying the possibility of a UN development bank, and so you know, Thatcher, despite um, you know her. Um, you know, clear allegiance towards the interests of finance capital, also very much presented herself as a champion of working people in the United Kingdom, was able to get elected upon that basis. But I don't think that same message works in 2023. Um, I think the working people in the United Kingdom are starting to recognise how those dynamics are impoverishing themselves, as much as people in the world itself. And I think that creates, you know, new opportunities for new allegiances in new historical conditions. Thank you.